I mean, read them. Or do you just read through them? Proverbs are not like any other book in the Bible. They're basically each verse, with the exception of several, but for the most part, each verse is a separate thought. And so when you're, uh, I I always kind of liken it to when you're chewing on the Proverbs, there's a lot of wisdom in there. And sometimes people read them and they have no idea what they mean or what they are. But I have a hard time reading the Proverbs without getting some kind of message from the Lord. And so Proverbs are good for business. If you're in business, it's a good idea to have the wisdom of God. Proverbs are good for Family structure, it's a good idea to have some wisdom in your family. Proverbs are good for finances. If you need to figure out how to be a good steward, read some financial advice from the book of Proverbs before you go to Forbes magazine. Proverbs are good for leading your own life. They're good for just a whole lot of stuff. The whole word means pro-verb, proactive, if you want to break it down into an English easy. It's a book of being proactive. In a society that's reactive, God wants us proactive. He wants us thinking ahead of situations and conquering them before they ever become issues. Proverbs 27 verse 7 says, The full soul loatheth, or is disgusted, if you will, by an honeycomb. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. To the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Anybody ever taste bitter? Has it ever just become sweet? It's a hard thing for us to try to understand that a bitter thing can be sweet, but the Bible says the in the whole key to that is hunger. So I want to use this as a topic tonight. I am hungry. Would you pray with me? King of glory, you're merciful. We do love and we do praise you. We magnify you, Jesus. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you for the word of the Lord. I pray God delivering this message, Lord, would be in your will, would touch hearts, O God, that are prepared for your holy word, and would change us. Lord, if the word of the Lord doesn't change us, it's not the word's fault, it's our fault. So I ask you, God, to prepare my heart, not just the heart of the congregation, but my heart, to line up with your word as well, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. As I get started on this tonight, I uh, I, I need to preface that uh, <clears throat> we are headed into a revival season, not just a revival weekend. Uh, we we have to we have to be um, aware of that. That when we when we set our revivals on the calendar for the year, we don't set those lightheartedly like, oh, this would be a good time to maybe have a special service or two. We don't do that lightheartedly. We do that because the Lord has given vision as to the ebb and flow of our spiritual walks. 
The Bible calls it the woof and the what? What is it? What is it called? The woof and the warp. There you go. Okay, there's there's kind of a, a a ebb and flow, if you will. There's an up and down. Um, there used to be something, and Brother Gary would know this. The wow on the on the tape deck. You remember that? The wow that wow 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 tapes would stretch and and uh, they wouldn't sound the same, so there would be a wow effect. And Memorex came out with a non wowing cassette tape. Most of you guys wouldn't have a clue what that is. And then they big, did this great big ad thing called Is It Live or Is It Memorex? Anybody remember that? That was because they took the wow out of the tape. Now, wow is a CD series every year for. Praise and worship CDs, I guess, but but uh, <laughs> but anyway, the uh, um, w- when we go into these I- into these uh, revival seasons, there's there's always a um, th- there's always a spirit that attacks. There's always a spirit that attacks. Now, w- we could probably place revival services any at, at any point on the calendar. And we would still have good services. But years ago, the Lord really, really led us to three particular times of the year when there is a spiritual attack, a heavy spiritual attack. One of those is when the kids go back to school. Now, parents, if you're apostolic parents and you've got kids in public school, you know exactly what we're talking about. Because all summer long, they've been embedded in, in youth events. They've been embedded in, I- embedded in church events and everything. And they've been serving God. And they've been doing a great job serving God. And they walk down that hallway on the first day. And every devil from hell, I think, shows up in those hallways. And it's usually about two to three weeks into the school year that your kids start getting attitudes. You thought it was a lack of sleep. No. It's a spiritual attack on your kids. And uh, they're, they're, they suddenly get surrounded by the wrong people again. The, the hours that they spend in spiritual attack far, far, far exceeds the few hours that you can get them to church on a weekly basis or the times that you should have family devotion but you just don't and it's not long and your kids are being destroyed right in front of you and a lot of parents don't know how to don't know how to deal with that well let's go back to the proverbs and just recognize it'll teach you how to be a parent. That book will teach you how to be a parent. I don't have a clue how to raise kids, but God does. And so we we, we take a look and, and see what, what does what saith the Lord on these matters. Because our kids are important, aren't they? And uh and, and so we we have to we we have to recognize that that we're 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 headed into a season where you know some parents are excited their kids are going back to school but then again some parents are just thinking oh lord they've done so well this summer they memorized scripture they went to camp they had great church services And they're not going to get that when they go back to school. The times that we had during the summer that we we had a lot of fun, but was it godly? The times that we had did we did we did we did we try to overcome and did we try to stack some things in their lives that were going to prepare them for the battle to come? Your kids are in a nine month long 
battle for their soul. Now, I'm not against education. In fact, I, I, I think education is, is incredibly important in the day we live. But you can't feed your kids to the wolves without having some kind of ammunition in their pocket. And they don't bring guns and knives to school, but they can bring prayer. They can bring the Word of God. They can bring a, a heart filled with prayer. And I, I like how, Sister Becker, I really appreciated that, that thing you did tonight the, the, with the, the video and then backing that up with, with the Word of God and, and, and how everything ties together. That, that's incredible. It's just spot on. It's just I, what I really love about our leadership here is I never give Sister Jerry Jo um, any notes about where we're gonna, what we're going to preach on. But she always finds songs that go along with the spirit of the service and with the message of the service. I love that. We, we, I didn't talk to Sister Becker and say, hey, it would be a good idea if you do something for the young people and this and that and the other, but, but just spot on. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to know that our leadership prays. They might not always be here on Tuesday nights, which if you can, please be here. There's times when you can't. I understand that. There's work schedules and there's uh, different things. And I'm, I'm on call usually with the police department on Tuesdays. So um, I, I'm, sometimes I, I can't be here. But, uh, and there's, there's this and that and the other thing that show up. But, but uh, it doesn't stop us from still praying. So we still pray. And uh, we still come together. If all, if all it is just for 10, 15 minutes, still come together and pray. Uh, God can do more in just a moment. You, you know that. You know that. How, how many of you ever received the Holy Ghost? It was just a moment that it happened. And look what he did. He flips your whole life around in a moment. So, you, so we, we understand what God can do in a moment. It wasn't last Sunday night just tremendous. Sister Tarika received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Ten years I've been praying for that lady. And I know Sister Liz has been praying longer than that. Ten years I've been just pounding on heaven's door, asking God, fill her. Her whole life will change. And uh, praise God, he filled her. So anyway, just a disclaimer that you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to hit some battles here in the next few weeks. That doesn't mean you have to lose them. Win the battle. You're going to have some battles. You're going to have some struggles. Thank the Lord that you have those struggles. If you've never had a struggle, you don't know what a victory feels like. You don't. You know, we right now we have a uh, we have such a a, a pain killing society that the the slightest little owie has to be ha, has to be medicated and dum numbed, dumbed <laughs> has to be numbed so that you can't feel anything. You, you, God forbid that you feel a poke in your spirit. You know. And, uh, and, and that's kind of the society we live in is, is we, just, we just want the pain to go away. We just don't want it. We just don't want it at all. But pain was created by God in your body to bring an alert. If you have pain, it's an alert. It's an alarm that says, whoa, hey, wait a minute, hold on. Something's got to be given attention to here. I got to give some attention to something here. There's, there's an area that, that needs attention. So thank the Lord for pain. We don't want too much of it. I mean, I'm not asking you to go out and just break your arm so you can feel it. That's just foolishness. But when you have pain in your soul, it's an alarm that your soul needs attention. 
It's an alarm. Don't ignore it. Don't neglect it. Don't just go on your merry way and say, well, you know, it'll go away. Uh Uh-uh. It goes away through prayer. It goes away through the Word of God. It goes away through worship. That's how you get rid of that pain in your heart and that pain in your soul and that pain in your mind because we, we, have, we have a society that we have had some rotten junk happen to us. I was, I was thinking, Brother Becker, you brought it up that, that you had not lost a peer. I've lost too many. I've lost way too many peers. I lost kids when I was in elementary school that were friends of mine. I lost them in high school that were friends of mine. Shortly after high school, I lost them that were friends of mine. I lost them to everything. I lost them to uh, I I lost them to drugs. I lost them to accidents, and I lost them to alcohol. I lost them to car accidents. I've lost them to uh, to suicide. I've, I've lost way too many friends. And the crazy thing is, as you said that, the first thought I had was. Who was there for me? Not in a, I wasn't whining and crying about it. I was just thinking that we have so many, um, how should I say, outlets offered to us. And when I was coming up, you just pulled your boots on and went back to work. Because stuff happens. Life isn't fair. You'll get through it. Every now and then, people would say to each other in a cold, very cold tone, get over it. And at the time, we didn't think too much of it because, well, we couldn't just run and get a whole bottle of oxycodone. We, we, never, we never thought of going and, and, and sitting at a psychiatrist's office and, and asking for a whole bunch of stuff. We never even thought of that at all. We just didn't think about it. You just went back to work and you just went through it and you just, you just got through it and you were stronger for it. Did it make some of us a little cold-hearted? Maybe. Maybe it did. Maybe it did make a few of us a little cold-hearted. But it created a work ethic and it created a society that said, we'll make it. It created families that said, we'll go through some hard times, but we'll get through the hard times. It created people that said, we're going to, all we do when this junk happens is we just grab each other's arms and we just walk through the storm together. Create a mentality that doesn't exist anymore. The mentality that exists today is, well, we gotta we gotta take twenty five weeks off of work, and we gotta suck our thumbs, and we gotta you know, and, and it's all right to talk to somebody. I'm not I'm not saying don't talk to anybody about your issues. It, it's okay. Just be very careful about who you talk to. If their prescription is anything other than the Bible, maybe you ought to uh, find out. You know, uh, uh, get a second opinion. Because if their prescription goes outside the Word of God, chances are they're probably not the right people to be talking to. Even the heathen uses the medicine of the Word of God from time to time, and they don't even know where they got the information from. We have to, we, we have to recognize that, that, that life has to balance out with victory and struggle. I hate to say struggle because I don't like that word. To me, it just sounds like like every day I'm just pouting and trying to make my way through. I'm not doing that. And you want to talk about struggle, just go back to the world. That's a struggle. I mean, there's not one day in the church I, always, I, I ever thought was 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 worse than a day in sin. But we have to we have to recognize in, in the days to come, in the weeks to come, the pr-
pressure's on. It's on for your children. So every day, every day, I'm going to ask you, pray for your children. I'm going to keep asking it. In fact, I'm going to keep preaching it because your children are important. You cannot lose your children. You can't afford to lose your children. You didn't invest all this time and energy of getting them cleaned up and brought to the house of God and, 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 and prayer and loving them and trying to provide for them just to lose them. Don't let the devil take your children. Back to Proverbs. Proverb means proactive. A verb is action. Means you're being proactive in your life. The whole book is. It, it, it really kind of, you know, a lot of people race to the Proverbs to find out how to fix a problem. <laughs> well, sometimes that's just a little too late. You go to the Proverbs to try to figure out how to not even get into the problem to begin with. How, how, do, how do I keep my life in line with the Word of God, and with the will of God, so that I don't even have to, you know. My, my wife has testified of this 100,000 times. If she has said it once, she said it 100,000 times. She is so very, very thankful for being raised in the church. She was delivered from more stuff than any common sinner has. Because she never had to touch the flame. People say, well, you know, people raised in the church, they're spoiled. Man, well, so be it. Maybe, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I don't know. Um, I, on, on one hand, I think that's all relative to your own opinion, whether somebody's spoiled or not. But to see somebody that's never had to taste of sin is a glorious thing. And by the way, that is the perfect will of God. Well, they've never had to go through anything. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the message. Can I? Liver and onions, who likes it? I'm not going to look because I just I, I don't want to change my perspective on loving you. <laughs> I love onions. Liver belongs in catfish bait. I'll eat the catfish. I hate the liver. That's got to be in Proverbs. <laughs> if it isn't, I'm going to I'm going to scratch it. <laughs> Right, right, right in the Proverbs 31, lady, don't cook liver for your husband. Collard greens. Cottage cheese. Worms. I've got, I've got a question. Has anybody ever intentionally eaten a worm? Me too. I have. I, when I was a kid, I ate worms. It's no big deal. Somebody said they're edible, so I tried one. They're full of dirt, by the way. But uh, spiders. Anybody ever eaten a spider intentionally? I've probably eaten a few of them in my sleep, but. <laughs> I've heard they're really good. Fried and deep fried. Uh, there's this goofy Goofy guy that has some food program deal. He eats weird stuff. And and I, I, I saw him eating a deep fried spider. And I thought, I would try that in a minute. It's cooked. It's cooked. Some of y'all ate spiders before in your food that probably weren't cooked. They were just in, they just fell in your food. But uh but to some of us, all this stuff kind of sounds gross, doesn't it? Uh, it even sounds offensive to our palate. I mean, it's. But somewhere, somebody thinks 
these things are a delicacy, whether it's one or whether it's any or whether it's all of those things. Taste of food depends on how hungry you are, doesn't it? Of course, how it's prepared, too. People have told me for years, they would, they, their way that they, they cook zucchini, I would like it. So far, if it's hidden in bread is the only way I like it. The rest of y'all are crazy. It's pig food. Just feed it to the hogs. <laughs> That's what I did with zucchinis when I was a kid. Threw them to the hogs and watched them. The hogs destroy them. But, uh, but many times when we're not eating the most flavorful item, we'll just push it aside. But if you get hungry enough, you'll go back to it. How many of us have ever been hungry? How many of us have ever starved? In America, we have to force ourselves to get hungry. We have to create hunger in ourselves. We we live in such a such a food rich society that we can get food just about anywhere, anytime. That we have, we have so much at our disposal, and literally in our disposals, so much food present with us that we can get a hold of, that we have to make ourselves hungry. Some people have come to me and said they didn't have any food. And, I, you know, I, I always feel bad when somebody doesn't have food. And I've given them food, no problem, you know, when I, when I can. But I've gone into homes, and, and please, uh, nobody here, so don't be looking around wondering who it was. I've gone into homes that said they had absolutely no food at all to walk in and find an incredible amount of food. And I've asked, where did all this come from? Well, we don't eat that. Thoughts of my childhood race back to me at what would mama do if I would ever sit down at her table and say I don't eat that (laughs) we're spoiled Because when you're hungry, you'll eat it, whatever it is. Here's the situation, though. In our society, people are hungry. They're incredibly hungry. They're not hungry in their belly, but they're hungry in their soul. Their souls are are starving to death and they're so hungry that they're running after everything they can. they've, They've got spiritual munchies, if you will. They're going crazy trying to trying to eat and gather and, and, and go crazy trying to get everything they can in their soul. And they don't realize that they are going to become what they are eating. Been told all of our lives, you are what you eat, haven't we? Anybody been told that? You are what you eat. Well, now, I, I don't mind being a steak. I don't mind being a nice vegetable. I, I don't mind being a potato or, a, or, or a, a big pot of jasmine rice. I don't mind that. But you know, there's some things I don't think I want to be. <laughs> 
I don't want to be a Big Mac. I don't want to be a Whopper. But the older you get, the more you recognize when you start eating garbage, you start recognizing, I am becoming garbage. You don't realize it when you're young. When you're young, you can handle a whole lot of Whoppers and Big Macs. But you turn about 30 or 40 and all of a sudden it's like, why did I eat that? It doesn't taste like it did 20 years ago. It doesn't have the same effects. 20 years ago I could eat it and, and go lay down and sleep like a baby and now I sleep like a rhinoceros. Like a walrus with a sinus infection or something, but uh, it's it just it does all kinds of crazy things to you. And you, the older you get, the more you recognize I am really becoming exactly what I'm eating. I've seen some some people recently that did not live a very um, godly life. They lived a life of drugs and alcohol and in their 30s, in their 30s, and they look like they're in their 60s or 70s. And I'm scratching my head thinking, what in the world happened to you? You used to be young and beautiful and full of life and you have no energy now. You, you live from, from bottle to bottle. You live from, from it, it's not even a paycheck. It's a welfare check to welfare check. You, you, you can't ever uh, pay your rent. You're, you're living in basically in, in substandard gross conditions because, because you're spending everything on substances, which have no substance, by the way. And I, it's, it, it just tears at me how people can age so rapidly because they are what they're eating. They're hungry and they're just trying to feed the hole. They're trying to fill the void. Now and then, um, I, I, I always say I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm just going to go, I've just got to have something to fill the hole, and, and I, I fill my belly full of, and I'm like, oh my, I wasn't that hungry. Why in the world did I just fill myself up with a whole pot of grease? Am I getting anybody with me yet? I'm really talking about our soul here. Talking about the things that we, we pack into our soul. We'll, we'll, we'll run around and, and sin. The Bible says sin is pleasure for a season. You know, kind of like when you're young and you want to eat a bunch of cheeseburgers. It works good for when you're young. When you get a little older, all of a sudden it's like, no. I think I better leave a lot of that alone because I'm, I'm quickly becoming a cheeseburger with double cheese and triple cheese and... And, and bigger bread. <clears throat> when we're when we're young, you ever heard of people sowing their wild oats? Never really considered that a uh, rite of passage. I always thought that was kind of silliness, even when I was young and stupid. I always thought, why would anybody want to sow, sow the wild oats? We don't have God to begin with. We're just lost anyway. But you just, people, people want to, they, 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 they think they want, this is going to be fun and that's going to be a great time and that's going to be super and that's going to be awesome and, and they get involved in it and, and, and the, the moments, there's, there's, there's moments of, uh, of fun and there's moments of amazing and there's moments of amusement and there's moments of recreation and there's lifetime of bills and payments and regrets. Lifetime of regrets. And I've, I've, I've 
talked to our young people many times about, you know, think, think about what this will cost you before you actually jump into it. Because people don't think about what it costs them because they've seen everybody else survive. But people aren't really surviving that well. We sang the song, Oceans, and, and barely, I'll keep my head above the waves. And sometimes that's just what it's like, is barely keeping my head above water. I'm not really surviving. I'm just getting just enough air to breathe, but I, I can't seem to, I, I can't walk above sin. I can't walk above problems. I can't walk in victory because I'm too busy to, to breathe. But this person and that person, they did it. And yeah, sit down and talk to them just a little bit about what their goals used to be and what their reality really is. Reality is, if they could do it over, they wouldn't do it at all. Thankful that God kept me from a lot of stuff. I, I lived an incredibly, incredibly reckless life. And, and I, I don't know why He kept me from things that killed friends of mine. I, I, I have no answer for it. No reason for me to be here and them to be lost in eternity. If you want to find somebody thankful for mercy, I'll raise my hand. I don't understand his mercy. I don't know why it lands on some people and, 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 and it, seemingly, it seemingly leaves others. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that stuff, but I do know when I was hungry, I always found something to eat. And I'm thankful that one day I found the right, the right food. He prepared this long before I was even a thought. He prepared this for me. And He prepared it for you. And for us just to neglect it is a shame. Say, so, well, I don't understand it. You understand how saturated fats work? You don't have a problem meeting them. You, under, you, you understand what you understand how how vitamins work? You don't have a problem consuming them. Well, sometimes you do. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that you don't understand, but it doesn't stop you from eating. Bologna and cheese sounds really good when you're young. But when you get old, you want to forget how to spell bologna. Everything about God is not strawberries and ice cream. Of course, I, I like strawberries and ice cream. Some things about God and some things about the way He does things, the, His procedures, if you will, that in my flesh I don't like. I don't like it at all. Fasting. You think I enjoy I love to fast. I'm signed up for fasting, but I guarantee you I don't like doing it. When I'm coming out of a fast and my spirit is, is, is far above the clouds and my flesh is finally under control, then I like it. I love the results of it, but I don't care for the process. 
I like to eat. Somebody asked me recently, oh, when you're fasting, how, what do you do? How do you do it? How do you do this? How do you do that? And I, I, I just gave a, a, a quick little five-minute explanation of, of the, the, the best way that I've found to do it is, is you know, open the lines of communication in the morning, kind of like that morning cup of coffee. Your breakfast should be Jesus. The most important meal of the day. Your breakfast should be the word of the Lord. You should just open up the lines of communication. Spend some time in the morning reading the Bible. Talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, you have full opportunity to interrupt any moment of my day. Open my eyes because, because when you start fasting, your, 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 your senses become alert. Heightened senses. I'm not even going to talk about fasting tonight. I don't know why I'm just carrying on. But, but, uh, but, but we, have to, we, we have to recognize that, that what, what we get in a fast is a whole lot more than hungry. If you're praying and fasting. But if all you're doing is fasting, all you're getting is hungry. You're losing a few pounds. You'll gain them right back. Don't worry. You're not going to get too skinny fasting. Wouldn't mind it, but I don't do it to lose weight. Total submission. I, you, know, I, you know, there's some things we like to submit to God in. You know, when it comes to finances, God, you're okay, I'll submit to you. You provide it all, so provide it all. I submit. I don't need to be responsible except for managing it. Praise God. I don't mind submitting to God and stuff like that, that all I have to do is just manage. That, that's fine. I can manage some things, Lord, but, you know, the responsibility of ownership is a little rough for me, so um, thank you. I don't own the world. You do. So submitting to God in some areas is fantastic, but total submission? Total submission gets a little bit hectic day to day. You know how you understand total submission? When all of a sudden something that you had isn't yours anymore. He decided, that, that's not yours. You wouldn't use anything that ugly, would you? That's little man's. <laughs> My goodness. That boy's crazy. Anyway, total, submit, total submission you recognize when all of a sudden you had something and now it's taken from you. And you still have the right attitude. And I guarantee you God's going to test you in it. Guarantee you. If you're going to serve the Lord, He's going to test you in it. He's going to hand something to you and He's going to take it away. For no reason at all. Just because he's God. And he wants to see who you are. You're going to be tested in it. A thousand times until you learn it. You'll be tested in it. We sang the song hundreds of times. He gives and takes away. Blessed. Job sang it. What did Job do wrong that he lost his children and everything that he owned? What did he do wrong? Nothing. Not one thing did he do wrong. But the Lord tested him. In the end, when Job finally learned his lesson and recognized, okay, it's all going to be good. It's all fine. The Lord put double back in Job's life. Why did God do that? Do you think maybe the Lord was trying to figure out if he could trust him? Well, the Lord already knew he could trust him. He didn't know how far he could trust him. Just like the Lord does the same thing with you and I. He knows he can trust us, but he doesn't know how far he can trust us. So he gives you something, and then he takes it away. He says, I don't know what you're going to do now. 
Anybody has had that happen to you? Many times. Many times. I'm scratching my head wondering, what did I do? The Lord's saying, you didn't do anything. But you're going to. As soon as you get yourself in the right frame of mind. As soon as you get yourself submitted to the right entity. You're going to do greater things. And we don't like those lessons. We hate them. Because nobody wants God to give them something and then it to be taken away. Nobody wants that. But the Lord will do it to you and he'll do it to you thousands of times until you get into total submission. When you get the attitude like, well, whatever you need, Whatever you need, God. I'm a servant, so wherever you need me to serve, I'll serve. We don't like learning it, but we learn it. So well, that's mean. No, it's not. It's not mean at all when you think about when when you think through it. When you think through it, it's not mean at all. It's an incredible way for God to say, I've tried to get your attention a thousand times, and this is what I have to do to get your attention. Say, all right, Lord, I got too busy thinking I was somebody, so now I'm back to being nobody, and I don't mind that. Nobodies are the biggest somebodies in the kingdom. Didn't the Lord himself say the first shall be last and the last shall be first? How about when when we can't glory in ourselves? I don't like that. I want to feel some kind of good about my accomplishments, don't you? I mean, don't you? Don't you want to feel like you've accomplished something? Trust? When I have to trust God for everything? You'll be you'll be tested in that too. You'll be really tested in that. Will you trust God or will you trust in chariots? The Bible says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we, talking about the nation of Israel, will remember the name of the Lord our God. But I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. I don't know about you, but I am so hungry for what God is about to do and for what God is doing. I just can't hardly contain myself. I, I, get, I, I, get, I get kind of the spiritual jitters. I get so excited about what God is doing that I just, I, I, just, I can't hardly contain it. I, I, I'm, I'm hungry for it. Some people, they look, they look at the problems and they look at their problems and they, they say, I don't think I can make it through that. And not me. I look at the problems and say, my God is still bigger than those problems. My God is still the answer. My God still pours out his spirit. My God still knows the way. He is still the way. He is still the truth. He is still the life. So we've got to be hungry. If we're going to see the revival that God is trying to give us, we're going to have to get hungry. And sometimes that means we're going to have to push ourselves to hunger. That's why we're calling for prayer. That's why we're calling for fasting. So that we don't just sit back and say, yeah, God's going to show up and do good stuff. He's going to show up all right, but he's only going to do what's needed. And sometimes what's needed is for the Lord to kind of just let us do our own thing because we're not listening to anything he says anyway. Ouch. I never want to get to the point where I do it my way. 
It's got to be his way or no way. Psalm 42, 1 says to the chief musician, Maskeel, for the sons of Korah, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. When you start to break that down, there's, there's a, a noise that you can almost hear. You can hear the heart panting. You can hear the, the, the deer, there's a heart. You can hear the deer come up to water. They've been out all day in the desert. And when you go over to Israel and you start looking around, you start recognizing, wow, I can see how animals can get thirsty out here. They'll walk for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles just trying to find food and more by after that trying to find water and so when they finally get to the water brook you can almost hear them panting for the water I don't know if anybody here's ever been that thirsty where where your, your mouth is so dry and, and your muscles are so weak and you're so sore and you've got a, a headache that's screaming. I mean, it, it feels like your head's in a vice. Your eyes feel like they're like, like, like you've got knives stuck in your eyes. You're so thirsty. And mama says you're dehydrated. Drink something. And you're like, no, I'm not. I'm sick. No, you're dehydrated. you got to drink something. No, I'm just sick. So what we want to do is we want to take a little sip of water and a handful of pills. The fact of the matter is, you drink a quart of water and you won't need a pill. Get a little water in your system. And you'll find out that your muscles start to stop. They stop aching a little bit. You start getting a little energy back. Your eyes aren't. The, 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 somebody pulled the daggers out of your eyes. You, you, you can open your eyes again. You can see. And the pressure is off your brain. And it's not so. Not screaming and pounding anymore. And. And. and all you can think of. I don't know if anybody ever here has ever been that thirsty. I have. When it felt like you just couldn't even stand any longer. And you just, you feel like you're, the last little bit of energy you're going to have is just to drink something. And you sit down for a few minutes and you just let your muscle cells absorb that. And you let your brains start to function again and you just can't help but say wow that is so refreshing you can almost imagine I don't know if you've ever seen a horse breathing so heavy or dogs breathing so heavy and panting so hard they need water and they finally get a little bit of water and an animal doesn't doesn't seem to know all the time how much water to consume i've seen them drink so much water that they just threw up i've drank so much water before that i've thrown it up but that's the idea in psalm 42 your soul needs to be hungry and thirsty for God. When people are satisfied with God, that's a scary situation. That's a scary thing when they're so satisfied that, oh, yeah, I'm good. Everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. Everything's fine. Everything's fantastic. All you got to do is step just a little closer to him and realize, no, it's not. No, it's not fine. No, it's not fantastic. No, it's not great. Uh, I, I might be doing good, but, but I, I look around and there's still a lot of mess. Life has a way of taking the taste of God out of your life, doesn't it? 